Thanks everyone for coming. My name is uh, Mark Pinchock. I'm a uh, paramedic crew chief with the City of Pittsburgh Emergency Medical Services. And we're going over a uh, problem we found with what we call crashing patients and a uh, quality improvement program we initiated to kind of deal with this problem. So I'm going to start with just a couple uh, case reviews, kind of show some of the problems we identified. So first case, um, crew response is a 54-year-old female. Um, they find her in severe respiratory distress, COPD asthma history. Uh, vital signs are up there. Uh, pulse is 140, respirations are 48, um, pulse ox 68%. They don't document they have blood pressure, they put her on the EKG. So uh, the treatment management log, they get some vitals. She goes on CPAP early, which is good, but uh, the pulse ox only comes up about 70%. And then we get a big gap in the time log, really nothing's getting done. You look at the narrative of the report, um, they were extricating the patient from the house with uh, some amount of difficulty. And so there's a big uh, gap in the treatment, no interventions are getting done. And at uh, 26 minutes in, this patient's arrest, CPR is initiated, uh, she deteriorates to asystole and is not resuscitated. Second case, 75-year-old female uh, presented to this crew just with uh, generalized weakness. Um, vital signs all look pretty good, and I know this washes up as a light. The blood pressure is supposed to be 88 over 64. So she's a little hypotensive. You look at it and say, well, it's not that terrible of a BP, really. She's just a little bit hypotensive. Everything else looks pretty good. And... Um, so they start off, they assess her, and kind of the first thing they do is move her um, out to the truck. So in Pittsburgh, we've got lots of houses on hillsides and lots of steps. So when you make a decision to move, it tends to take you a little while to uh, accomplish that. Um, so the x of the truck, um, it gets about 20 minutes into the call before they get some IV access, um, starts some fluids, and then uh, this patient subsequently suffers a uh, VTAC arrest um, en route to the hospital. Um, she is resuscitated, though. So we started identifying this problem, uh, reviewing um, airway and cardiac arrest reports. And uh, so over a three-year period, we kind of identified 64 cases where patients were arresting after the crew made initial contact. And these weren't uh, chest pain patients having sudden V-fib arrest and you defibrillate them once and they're okay. Um, it was a mix of uh, respiratory patients, shock, altered mental status, and uh, some cardiac cases in there. And uh, this data set only has um, patients where an uh, advanced airway was placed. Um, it doesn't include patients who uh, just got BVM ventilation. Um, just because when we started tracking this, um, this tracked out of the, um, our airway audit. So to keep things consistent, we kind of tracked just the same way. But um, given that, we kind of felt like we're really just kind of catching the um, tip of the iceberg here um, with these patients. Because like I said, we're not including in this data set right now patients who poop out and just get BLS CPR on the way in the hospital, patients that are uh, peri-arrest when we bring them into ED, and uh, problems like that. So and you look at these numbers, they look tremendously big. Um, we run about 55 to 60,000 calls per year, you know, somewhere around 300 cardiac arrests per year. So it's probably about 5 to 7% of our cardiac arrest um, subset that uh, fall into this kind of crashing category. Um, eight of these cases were what we call kind of the early arrest patients, um, where they basically arrested shortly after the crew made contact. So they walk in, the patients are extreme in arrest. Probably not too much uh, we re really can do about that, that uh, subset. But the ones we wanted to go after are these 56 cases of what we call late cardiac arrest, um, where they arrested um, outside of five minutes of patient contact. So you look at the times, there was a fair amount of time um, from patient contact to the arrest occurred. Um, the median time from when the, the paramedics made contact with the patient till they uh, went into cardiac arrest was about 16 minutes. So that's a fair amount of time. The median time was about uh, 15 minutes. So half of these patients, you had in excess of 15 minutes to um, intervene. And uh, so there was a lot of time to uh, do interventions. Um, when you look at the, uh, the standard deviations, about 50% of these patients are arrested uh, between 9 and 21 minutes after patient contact was made. So once again, it's not like you're, in the bulk of these cases, crews were walking in and the patient had an immediate rest. There was a lot of time to get in there and make an intervention. Looking at uh, what these patients were sick with, um, the biggest bigger group were patients with respiratory distress. Um, that was 44%. Um, after that, patients with altered mental status and shock um, were the bulk of the uh, other groups. And uh, when we started analyzing this data, we kind of split these patients into two groups, um, patients with respiratory problems and patients with non-respiratory problems. And when we kind of segregate them out into two groups, we started seeing some differences. Um, the respiratory of patients tended to arrest later in the call. Um, their median time to arrest was almost 18 minutes, and only one of those early arrests occurred in this group. Um, the non-respiratory cases tended to arrest earlier. Um, the median was uh, 14.6 minutes, 
and the other six are early arrests were there. So your respiratory patients, um, ones that we can actually, we'll show later on, can bring a lot of stuff to the table for, um, gave you more time to intervene. And when you compare these two groups, you can see the uh, non-respiratory cases tend to tail off and arrest kind of earlier in this curve than the uh, respiratory patients did. So we had um, you know, a little gapping in the time to arrest on both those things. But in both groups, there was still a fair amount of time to uh, do an intervention. Look at the vital signs. It's pretty obvious um, these patients were a sick group. Almost 70% of them had altered mental status and a mean Glasgow coma score of 9.8 or 10. So they were at fairly well uh, depressed level of consciousness. When you looked at the documented vital signs, 70% of them were hypoxic. 60% had some level of uh, either tachypnea or bradyapnea. Um, they had tachycardias, abnormal EKGs, and 40% uh, or so were hypotensive with a systolic pressure than less than 90. So it would reason that, you know, based on vital signs, you had pretty good warning these patients were going to go south. Um, one of the first problems we identified was that the vital signs weren't measured all that often. Um, when you look at how often each uh, physiological parameter was managed or measured, um, respiratory patients, uh, respirations and heart rate were measured uh, in excess of 90% of the time, which you would expect. But um, systolic pressures were only taken about two-thirds of the time. Um, SpO2 was only documented about 60% of the time and the EKG was getting put on about half the time. So um, the first problem we identified is we weren't getting that physiological monitoring in place and we were losing that opportunity to get early warning not only that the patient was in trouble but um, that they were about to uh, collapse on us. When the vital signs were measured we compared the uh, vital sign alterations between the two groups. On the respiratory side um, it would be, seem kind of common sense um, we saw more incidents of have, um, having respiratory uh, dysfunction. Um, they were tachypneic, tachycardic, abnormal EKGs, which were usually tachycardias, and all of, this, all of them were uh, hypoxic. Looking on the respiratory side, they tend to predominantly have more uh, predominance for decreased level of consciousness. Um, almost three quarters of them had a um, depressed LOC, and their mean Glasgow coma score was eight and a half or so, and 60% uh, of them were hypotensive. So we saw kind of an interesting uh, predominance between the two groups, what you would see on the uh, vital sign alterations. And when we took a look to see what the alteration were between the two groups and what kind of was borne out by the previous slide, um, the respiratory patients looked pretty sick. 64% um, of them had alterations in three, or three areas at least. So they were tachycardic, they were tachypneic, they were hypoxic. Interestingly enough, on the non-respiratory side, they tended not to look as sick, at least physiologically. Um, a quarter of them only had one vital sign alteration and um, another 40% of them had alterations in only two areas. So the respiratory patients tended not to look as sick where the uh, respiratory patients did. And I'll show you in a couple minutes why that seems to make a little bit of difference in the care that was provided. So we looked at uh, what was done for these patients. 73% um, of them were moved to the uh, ambulance prior to the arrest occurring. In the uh, respiratory group, almost all of them, 92% were moved. The non-respiratory group, about 60% were moved. And we're kind of looking at the reasoning for that. Kind of looked at there was a couple of different possibilities. Possibility number one, that those non-respiratory patients arrested earlier, so maybe they didn't have a uh, chance for the move. Or number two, they didn't look as sick physiologically, so uh, maybe the crew didn't feel a need to move them as fast. So at first glance, you look at that and say, okay, they were moving the patients to the uh, trucks. They were, uh, saw they had sick patients. They were trying to get things moving. And that was fine, except for when we took a look at what was getting done for these patients. And uh, we were losing the opportunity to treat these patients because the uh, predominant thing was moving them to the ambulance and we weren't getting other things done. So like I said, 73% of these patients got moved to the ambulance prior to them arresting. But you look at the other interventions that were done there and not a whole lot of stuff got done. Um, well, actually, the least was only documented about 60% of the time in these patients. Um, positive pressure or some kind of airway ventilation was about uh, 40%. Um, only about a quarter of them got an IV initiated and uh, only a small percentage got a um, flu bolus for hypotension. And also small numbers received CPAP or some kind of airway intervention. So we look at these numbers of these patients and you know, it just appears that most of that time to get these interventions done was lost because we were moving the patients uh, to the ambulance instead of getting them treated. And look at what was done for these patients comparing the respiratory versus the non-respiratory groups. Um, you know, a lot of people, they got all oxygen, which was good, but then after that, not a whole lot of stuff got done. Um, if you look at the interventions for um, respiratory patients here, CPAP, positive pressure, you know, BLS and advanced airway, um, was all only getting done 30% of the time or less. And you look at the um, IV percentages, less than 30%, and 
and uh, for hypotensive patients, less than 30% receive fluids. Um, so the numbers don't look good, but they match what's in the literature. Um, Richard Seymour, who's done a lot of uh, research on sep sepsis and a really big advocate of pre-hospital care septic patients, um, did a study in Philadelphia that was published back in uh, 2010 looking at pre-hospital interventions for septic patients. And you see pretty much the same trends there. Um, around a third of the patients get IVs and fluids, similar numbers for at least documentation of oxygen and other interventions there, physiological monitoring the EKG. So when you look in the literature, this isn't kind of a unique thing to our system. Um, it's been documented that it occurs um, kind of all over the country. And the last thing we kind of saw is when interventions were done, they weren't being done very efficiently. If you compare um, from the median time to the patient arrested and look at the time it took to get stuff done, um, we were wasting about half of that time. It took a, you know, an average of eight minutes to get people on CPAP. It took um, you know, 10 to 12 minutes to get people with IV access and do airway interventions. So um, when, when we do, did do the correct interventions, they weren't being done very efficiently, at least from a uh, time point. When these patients arrested, you saw very little VFib, um, not in the respiratory case. It was all asystolic or PEA arrests. Um, on the men respiratory, we did see a little bit of VFib, but that was the least frequent rhythm seen. We only saw VFib about a quarter of the time. And our basic theory on what was going on is by not aggressively treating these patients, we we're allowing them to become physiologically exhausted. Um, they had very, very bad pathology. They had very, very bad physiology. They were hypoxic, hypotensive, um, hypercarbic, acidotic, and uh, we weren't intervening to kind of interrupt this. And if you don't intervene in rupture, you end up with this cascade of cellular death that occurs. And um, if you don't interrupt and stop this, they kind of just poop out. And that's why we have kind of these bradyacystolic arrests. And this matches up with what you see in the, your ACLS guidelines. If you look at the 2010 update, our H's and T's, our six H's correctable causes, half of them are probably stuff that we were seeing going on in these patients. You know, they were hypovolemic, they were hypoxic, they were getting acidotic either metabolically or respiratory wise, and they just poop out. And it's kind of supported by what happened after they arrested. So after these patients arrested, this is a witnessed arrest in front of at least two paramedics when this happened, um, we only resuscitated about 30% of them. And that defining resuscitation is delivering the ED with a pulse. That's not a survival to discharge number. So we only get about 30% of them back. You might look at that number at first and say, well, that's not that terribly bad a number. But our all system service uh, delivery of uh, patients to ED with a pulse post arrest is around 40%. So, um, and that's including, as everyone knows, about a third of those patients you see service wide, you never have a chance on. Those are your non witnessed asystolic, no CPR, terminally ill, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These patients that were witnessed arrest by two medics um, did worse. And our theory was just they were, there was that bad physiology where they got too acidotic, they got too hypoxic, they got too hyperperfused, and uh, they were arresting. So we identified this as a problem in the system, and we wanted to take a look at what was going on. So we did a uh, root cause analysis. We followed up with Cruz after this and just did some interviews and say, hey, what was the decision making? Um, what led you to make this decision? Um, it was, one, you know, we kind of saw an interesting dichotomy. You know, some people said, I didn't think the patient was all that bad. Kind of that second case I showed you um, where yeah, the patient was a little bit hypotensive, didn't seem all that bad to the crew. Or it took the flip side where you had that really sick respiratory patient and the crew was like, yeah, this guy was really sick and I had to get him out of here. Um, so we kind of saw a little bit of dichotomy there. Um, we saw a lot of people wanted to move the people, patient to the ambulance first and then start the interventions. You know, because, because people are more comfortable working out of the truck. It's easier. You're in a controlled environment. If things go bad, it's a little easier to intervene. Some people thought, you know, the physical conditions of the structures they were in or bystanders was going to hinder care. And then the other thing we saw is that people just didn't think we had good therapies. Yeah, you know, we'd put an IV in and maybe give them a couple medicines. Nothing we're going to do is going to make this patient better in the next 10 minutes and uh, what we can provide them um, wasn't going to help them. So basically it looked like it's kind of these crash and patients subset. Um, crews were taking kind of a load and go approach. And load and go is good for certain situations. Trauma, it's a no-brainer. Trauma is a load and go. All the literature supports that. Uncontrolled internal hemorrhage is a load and go. You know, if someone's dissecting an aneurysm or has some other uh, in uncontrollable bleeding point, that becomes a load and go. And even acute stroke on the medical side somewhat is a load and go. Yeah, we do some basic stuff. We put them on O2, we check the glucose, we do the stroke screen. But we really don't have a theory to offer them. We need to expedite transport to a stroke center where they can look at intervening. So, you know, those conditions, that's fine. Load and go is completely appropriate. But it's probably not appropriate for these really sick medical patients. Um, these people with severe respiratory distress and failure, 
um, patients in medical shock, patients who are septic, uh, hypovolemic from a medical uh, reason or even cardiogenic shock. Um, it's probably not a good idea. And even load and play, like we kind of demonstrated with our statistics there, um, probably is not the uh, best thing to do. And just talking to the crews, it seems like we kind of get in that fight and flight a little bit. You know, we get that kind of really sick patient, um, especially on the respiratory side where they look really um, overtly sick. And uh, you get the adrenaline rush, and people get in that fight or flight, and they get in, okay, let's just get this person moving, get them going. And uh, we're really trying to change our paradigm to take the fight side of that. Don't do the flight, take the fight, stand and, point, stand and uh, take care of people. Because we really have a lot of good therapies we can offer to these really sick medical patients. Um, you know, we see a lot of medical shock in the field. Um, it's uh, documented a lot in the, the literature. But, you know, nationally, less than 50% receive IV access. Um, if you give IV access, especially people who are um, septic, um, they get more fluid and they tend to uh, reach their resuscitation goals earlier than if you didn't intervene. Um, this is more data from Seymour, and like I said, he's done a lot of the um, pre-hospital research on sepsis lately. But he saw in his uh, Philadelphia co cohort of patients, if the patients got an IV in the field and got some fluid, they tended to um, meet their target and maps and fluid resuscitation goals a lot earlier than if they didn't. So it's clearly a benefit in a sepsis bundle. I worked with a partner once who said, you know, IVs aren't a big deal and IVs not going to save anyone's life. But looking at more of the sepsis data, it does. Um, this was published uh, in 2012 by Seymour and uh, looking at intravenous access for um, septic patients once again. And uh, if in the sepsis groups, if we intervene pre-hospitally, put an IV in and initiate fluid resuscitation and get a fair amount of fluid in the patient, there's a significantly reduced uh, odds ratio of death for those patients. And the interesting part is he saw a trend that even if they just had access and not a ton of fluid, the patients tended to do be better too. Now, if that's just because in the ED they got care quicker or something, but uh, you know the patients did better pre-hospitally with pre-hospital intervention. And he really fell a couple quotes out of his paper: um, "Timely pre-hospital interventions make a positive difference on sick patients. Early targeted interventions, um, especially IV access with those of uh, severe illness, improves outcomes." Look at some of the literature from aeromedical cardiac arrest. Um, this is a uh, study out of uh, University of Pittsburgh. But they found uh, patients that were being aeromedically uh, transferred and suffered a uh, medical cardiac arrest. If there was already an IV in place, it was associated with statistically significant improved uh, return of circulation at the destination. So if you had that IV in place and something went bad, it was easier to intervene, at least from medications. Congestive heart failure, respiratory issues. There's a lot of care we can bring to these people. Um, this article is kind of old, but it was pre-CPAP days for some of you that uh, didn't start where we didn't have CPAP. But um, it sh data show that if you were aggressive in treating CHF patients with nitroglycerin, they did a lot better. And the care got uh, done a lot earlier than waiting you got to the ED. In 2007, the Ontario for Hospital Advanced Life Support Study so in the, uh, Ontario, there was no ALS. They added it. They looked at before and after. They had a statistically uh, significant improvement in uh, outcomes for respiratory patients with ALS, especially in patients with congestive heart failure, COPD, and pneumonia. It's also been uh, documented that for people with severe bronchospasms and severe asthma who receive uh, steroids pre-hospitally um, have fewer hospital admissions. So there's a lot we can really bring to the table for these really sick medical patients. And kind of the paradigm shift we're trying to teach people is that you know, if you had the ability to teleport that patient from wherever they were to the emergency department, the care they would provide in the first 10 to 20 minutes is absolutely no different from what we can provide. This is from an emergency medicine uh, textbook, Acute Management of Acute Asthma in the Emergency Department, and it's all stuff that we can do. Oxygen, obviously, uh, beta agonists, subcutaneous epi, steroids, magnesium, CPAP, BiPAP, and intubation. It's all care we bring. So there's not a real benefit to grab these patients and run with them when they're sick. If we're delaying that care, we're not getting stuff done efficiently, we're allowing all that bad physiology to persist and uh, the patients get in trouble when they die. So in response to this, we initiated a uh, rapid quality improvement program. We called it Crashing Patients to try to prevent these patients from kind of crashing and burning. And kind of the key issue we were addressing is to stop delaying critical interventions. Take care of critical stuff, ABC stuff, IV access, monitoring, appropriate medications and fluids. 
Um, so we really want to address that. Um, early venous access, we really want to do what we call maximum medical therapy. You know, hit these patients with everything we have and get this all done where we find the patient. We demonstrated in this sick group, it's not safe to move these people until you've done appropriate things to kind of stabilize their negative physiology a little bit. So we really want to kind of take care of ABC issues, um, non-invasive ventilation as needed, access drugs, get help, and then move the patient. Because like I said, we make these early moves, it's hard to get stuff done. It's easy to say, hey, okay, let's just get the person out of the truck and get stuff done. But you can't do monitoring all that well in the middle of a move. If you're carrying someone down three flights of stites in a stair chair, we're not managing the airway while we're doing that. You're not getting the IV in, you're delaying kind of the life-saving interventions. We're delaying getting fluids and medications into these people, and we let that bad physiology persist. We let the hypoxia and acidosis and everything continue to exist, and it kills the patient. Uh, Dr. Peter Saffer, who worked at the uh, University of Pittsburgh before his death, um, is one of the fathers of modern uh, critical care medicine and uh, cardiac resuscitation. One of his favorite sayings was that critical care is a type of care. It's not a location. You know, as paramedics, we bring that, cater, that cater, critical care to the patient in the field. And on the BLS level, you're doing the same thing. A lot of the stuff that's going to save the person that first 10 minutes is good, aggressive BLS care, managing the airway, managing ventilation. So we bring the care to the patient. Don't bring the patient to the care. So responses we developed what we call our crashing patients algorithm. And there's no new science here. There's no new fancy piece of equipment. It's just adjusting the strategy. And the strategy is really we get someone who looks sick, stand, take care of them there, take care of ABC issues, aggressively manage where their problem is medically, and then make your move. So our entrance into this is um, taking a look, hey, I got someone who looks sick to me. You know, first thing we do an assessment, general impression. General impression of the patient looks like he's in street streetness. The stuff we demonstrated physiologically that's problems is uh, altered mental status, airway problems, significant respiratory distress, and uh, tachycardia or sinus shock. First thing we want people to do is call for help. Get more sets of hands there. So if this call does go bad, we've got four providers instead of two providers. Also, that second unit can plan and get the equipment ready for the move. We shouldn't be, if we've got a real sick patient, we should be splitting our crew and sending one person to get a stair chair or a stretcher or something else. And then take care of BLS. If there's an airway issue, BLS airway, position, suction, nasal airway, or airway, wherever it's um, indicated. We're aggressive on uh, feeding people on non-invasive caponography, and I'll go over the reasoning for that in a couple minutes. And then get all the monitoring in place, the EKG, pulse ox, non-invasive blood pressure. Um, get this full set of physiological monitoring in place. If there's a problem, we can detect it now, and we can trend it. And we're going to see if that patient's getting better or getting worse on us. So once again, we get the full set of vital signs, pulse ox, EKG, caponography. And then after uh, IVs in, obviously, we can check glucose and lactate as indicated. Um, so just remember, pulse ox is telling me about oxygen oxygenation. Um, Caponography is telling me about ventilation. So it's giving me kind of two different pieces of information. That's why we're real heavy on using the uh, non-invasive caponography for these patients. And the question is, if the patient's going to get in trouble, when do we want that early warning? When do we want to know? We want to give ourselves that lead time that we can intervene. If we just uh, don't do anything, the patient's going to rest in front of us, and uh, we're going to have to deal with it when it happens. We're not going to have any warning. I put them on uh, EKG. Not a whole lot of early warning with that generally. You know, you get maybe five, ten seconds before they brady down or they have a uh, ventricular arrhythmia or something else. Put them on pulse ox. Hey, maybe I get a minute warning before they desaturate. And caponography gives me really um, a lot of early warning. That's going to give me maybe five to ten minutes warning things are starting to go south with this patient. And that's why we emphasize it. But like I said, the CO2 gives me a lot of information. It let me, gives me information on their ventilatory status. Um, their perfusion status, it's a, a surrogate marker for uh, perfusion. In bad perfusion states, it's going to be low. And it looks, you know, it's going, into uh, going on in the lower airway to an extent. Um, if I see bronchospasm or something else, I'll detect that. Um, so it gives you a good fix. So low uh, case example showing low uh, ETCO2. Um, in this case, crew find a 70-year-old female unresponsive GCS of 3. Um, placed a, a oral airway, started bagging, put the inline caponography in and uh, got a CO2 reading of 13. So the crew is trying to say, hey, what's going on? CO2 is 13. Able to assess the person a little better. Um, no peripheral pulses, couldn't obtain a BP, and that CO2 was just giving them a surrogate of uh, bad perfusion. So as this slide's a little bad. I shouldn't be saying early shock, but 
Um, if your person's not in shock already, if your CO2 starts to downtrend and they're not hyperventilating themselves or being hyperventilated by you, um, it's an early warning that we're having a uh, perfusion issue. It's also really good for differentiating between respiratory distress and uh, respiratory failure. So this is two patients, both with asthma, both wheezing, um, 126 on the right there, 154 on the left. Uh, which one are you guys worried about more, the 54-year-old or the 26-year-old, based on uh, those set of vitals? Any thoughts, volunteers? Young guy or old guy? Anything? Yeah, generally, you think, hey, I'm a little worried about that older guy. You put him on caponography, though, and the young guy has a CO2 of 51, and he has a pretty pronounced uh, shark fitting going on, something like that, so that shows he's bronchospasm. This guy's CO2 is okay. It's only actually 32. So this guy was actually okay, and he did fine with a little bit of albuterol. This guy was in trouble. And uh, like I said that the end tidal CO2 is kind of a surrogate for um, what your arterial CO2 is. Uh, arterial CO2 is a 50 or more are uh, generally associated with life-saving, or sorry, life-threatening asthma. So um, you got two guys, you know, they both kind of look the same physiologically, and you put the cap and R if you on, I gave you early warning that 26 was going to, irritable was going to get in trouble on you. And we'll review with, uh, what happened with him a little later in the presentation. So after we've taken care of all the uh, ABC issues, um, we go on, move on, what's the respiratory status? You know, is this guy okay, or is he just having a little bit of respiratory distress? or is he getting into uh, respiratory failure? It makes a big difference what I need to do with him next. Um, and and pick, up, the pick up between respiratory failure and respiratory distress is a little subtle. I mean, I've talked to a lot of our doctors, hey, is there one hard number we can use if the SAT's this or a CO2's that or the heart rate's this? There's really no one hard thing we can use to say, hey, this guy's definitely in uh, respiratory failure. Um, so it's kind of a subtle pickup. And for me, at least, I don't know what you guys' experience is and wants to chime in, I kind of look at the stuff that's highlighted there as being uh, the stuff that really tips it off. You know, are they able to speak to you or not? Do they still have good muscle tone? Are they able to sit themselves up and tripod themselves? And are they still uh, conscious and alert and uh, talking to you? Um, if they're not doing that, they're probably in failure. So, you know, so the kind of the respiratory stress side, once again, you know, they've got that good muscle tone. Um, they're moving good air. Generally, we can maintain an SpO2 greater than 90 with uh, either non-invasive ventilation, CPAP, or supplemental O2. And if you're monitoring CO2, it's either stable or decreasing. Once we flip that failure side, that's a guy that's not moving air anymore. Um, he can't talk to me anymore. He's losing his muscle tone. He can't sit himself up. His head's bobbing around, and uh, his mental status is decreasing. And if we see that kind of failure, we've got to make an urgent intervention. So if the patient's just in respiratory distress, hey, do what needs done. High flow O2, put him on albuterol, put him on CPAP, do whatever else needs done and we'll move on and uh, check the uh, circulatory status out. If he's in respiratory failure, we need to stop everything we're doing right away and go to positive pressure ventilation. If they're in respiratory failure, we stop and bag the person. You've bought yourself time. Um, and it's probably the quickest and easiest thing we can do to this patient. It just doesn't get done a lot because people get distracted. They're trying to do a bunch of other things. They're trying to... Um, they're trying to... You know, start IVs, move the patient, do whatever else, and they kind of lose picture, hey, this person's in respiratory failure. And if we don't intervene, that patient's going to progress from failure to arrest and then have cardiac arrest. So we're going to be really aggressive as far as, hey, if you think that's going on, drop everything to do and bag the patient. If you can bag the patient effectively, unless something's gone really catastrophically wrong that we can't fix, like it's a massive PE or something else, um, you've bought yourself time now. We've got a lot of time, and uh, we can make our next move. So once we start seeing that respiratory failure going on, stop everything. We want people to stop everything we're doing and start bagging. And then you can go from there. Sometimes you may bag a little bit too early. That patient's still a little bit awake. Maybe you blow some CO2 off and you increase their SATs. They start waking up on you. That's fine. You can transition them back to uh, CPAP at that point. If they don't improve, then we move on to placing an advanced airway. We kind of really emphasize our personnel kind of move through this progression. You know, start with high flow too. They don't do well. Put them on CPAP. They're still not doing well. Try bagging them. You know, if they get better with bagging, you can fall back to CPAP. There's a case presentation that will illustrate this. This is a cruise off, uh, 85-year-old female complaining of being short of breath. Look at the vital signs. You think she's in distress or failure? Failure, yeah. She's uptunded. GCS is 8. Um, SATs are bad. CO2 is 95. So she's in failure and uh, clearly in respiratory failure. So the crew makes the right decision, and they start bagging her. They go straight to positive pressure ventilation. She gets a little bit, a few minutes of positive pressure ventilation. Um, her SATs come up to 97, CO2 drops off to 92, 
and uh, she wakes up now. See, uh, uh, GCS is 15. She's awake. Uh, she starts getting a little bit uh, uncomfortable with being bagged. So she looks pretty good at this point. So they transition her back to uh, CPAP. Put her on CPAP. Now she's receiving aggressive medical therapy for uh, bronchospasm while she's getting this. But transitions to CPAP, conscious and alert, vital signs, SAT, CO2, everything looks pretty good. And it's just kind of following that progression. So we've taken care of the uh, respiratory part of the problem. Either way, either we're bagging the patient or they're on non-invasive, you know, supplement O2 or CPAP. And next thing is address circulatory staph if there's any problem. If the uh, they're hypotensive, the first thing is, hey, is there an arrhythmia causing this problem? If there is, we're very aggressive as far as uh, managing that with electrical therapy, pacing for bradycardias, cardioversion for tachycardias. After we manage the arrhythmia, if they're still hypotensive, we go for immediate access. Don't wait till you move them to the truck. They get immediate IVIO access where it's appropriate. Um, we, moved, we did a new thing where we added pressure infusers to all of our IV kits now. So we want them to put them on pressure, get fluid in as fast as possible as long as they're not in CHF. And then once we have that access, we can check a glucose, we can check a lactate, reassess the patient, and uh, see where we are. If we go the IO route, um, Pennsylvania State Protocols has us throw uh, one or two cc's of lidocaine in just to numb up that marrow space before you start pushing fluids. Because uh, if you've ever done that, if a lot of people have probably, um, that's pretty painful even for a minimally responsive patient. But now we've kind of addressed all the ABC issues. We're managing the airway, we're managing respirations, um, we have access, we're managing blood pressure, and now stop, reassess the orgone. Patient getting better, patient not getting better. Um, access the appropriate protocol at that point, and then in, consult in consultation with Medic Command, we want to go ahead and do maximal medical therapy based on the protocols and what's wrong with the patient. So for the asthma and COPD set, obviously we're going to hit them uh, with albuterol and CPAP, positive pressures needed. And one of the things we really reemphasize, and I think our system, I've seen other systems that kind of got away from this every year, is getting back to it, these sick, especially sick young asthma patients, um, giving IM epi. Uh, we really kind of got away from that because we had albuterol and other um, inhaled beta-2 agonists, and uh, you know, most people get better with that. But if you look at someone with asthma, COPD, who's in trouble, one of the quickest uh, things we can do is just give them that sub-Q epi. I'm sorry, that IM epi. Um, you don't need an IV. It's relatively quickly absorbed. It's relatively uh, quick acting. Um, so we really emphasize our person, hey, if the patient's 50 or less and doesn't have any significant core morbidities, really get that on early and then move on to the other stuff. Um, and we also aggress as far as um, getting steroids early. We use solumedrol. Um, we use magnesium as a bronchodilator also. And then after all that stuff's in, it's been five or ten minutes, they can always call the uh, physician and add more epinephrine as uh, indicated. For uh, CHF, you know, really the lifesavers, and the previous study showed, kind of your lifesavers is really just the CPAP, plus or minus albuterol, and then aggressive nitri nitrates if they're hypotensive. I'm sorry, hypertensive. Um, we still use Lasix. We use it infrequently. The science is really kind of moving away from that a little bit. But um, we still use Lasix for some people with uh, chronic failure. And then aggressively uh, managing hypotensives. So, I mean, if it's non-cardiogenic shock, I mean, 500 cc bolus is a saline until we get to two liters. Um, if there's no response after that, you can consider dopamine, depending on what the problem is. And then for cardiogenic shocks, as long as the lungs are clear, potentially look at some small fluid boluses, and then either uh, dopamine or dobutamine, um, depending on what the systolic pressure is. So it doesn't take long to accomplish, um, like I said, we're an all ALS2 paramedic system. Um, generally, people can run through that in 10 to 15 minutes. And by then, hey, your backup's there, you got help there, you're planning for your move, and uh, now we can kind of make a safe move of the patient. We've monitored them, we've addressed their ABC issues, we've aggressively given them the correct medications, fluids, or whatever for what their base problem is, and now we can make a safe movement to the ambulance and continue to monitor and care. So that's kind of the strategy uh, we uh, adopted, and I'll go over now some of the stuff of how we implemented this and what the results were for the system. So we implemented this kind of a rapid improvement project, and we did it over two pilot phases, training about 40, 30 to 40 people uh, each block. Um, we did this fall of 2012, spring of 2013, and that trained about half of our personnel. Um, and you might say, well, you only got half your people trained. Um, what kind of impact is that going to have on your patient care? But we found from other products, if we trained half our personnel, they got, in this case, 78% um, of the calls had at least one trained medic on them. So we got at least one person that had been trained um, almost to all the calls. And we do this a little differently than we do our uh, regular training blocks. So our regular training blocks, we do big um, 
lecture kind of format like we're doing here. You know, we'll bring 16, 20 people at a time, cram them in the classroom. Half of them are sleeping, half of them are on their uh, iPhones or stuff, and you kind of lose people. Um, so we kind of changed our paradigm. Like we do this small unit training. We bring people in uh, in two to four um, personnel blocks. Um, we do just a targeted two-hour session with them, and it's almost like a one-to-one -one almost with the instructors. So we keep the people a lot more engaged. And uh, for this program we were in, this is kind of a pre-test, post-test formula. They came in. Um, they did uh, two simulated cases on a sim man that were taken out of um, this kind of crash patient uh, group that we had. We gave them one respiratory patient, one respiratory case and one shock case. Um, they ran a pre-test. We, we uh, you know, kind of recorded what they did. And after that, we put them through a lecture, kind of say, hey, here's the problem, kind of similar to what I'm doing here today. Here's what the problem is on our system. Here's what's going wrong. Here's how we want to fix it. Here's the algorithm we want you to use. And then we uh, put them through a, res a different uh, respiratory and shock post case. We did have some precedents for doing training like this, um, improving uh, care in the system. Um, back in 2008, prior to the uh, 2010 AHA uh, update for minimally interrupted in CPR, we implemented a minimally interrupted program in our system. And we saw just off the pilot phase, six months in, we had a statistically significant uh, increase in delivering people to the ED with pulses, just off a pilot phase on one of these rapid improvement projects. So uh, we felt comfortable running these that we can get rapid improvement in the system that would uh, demonstrate um, better patient care. So we ran the uh, course. Um, here's some of the classroom data. So we got, this is a respiratory case. Um, we got a lot more efficient as far as uh, getting interventions done, as far as you know, making sure the patient got all the appropriate interventions done and doing the interventions in a much more timely manner. So this is time in seconds. And you can look at um, appropriate mo time to appropriate monitoring, airway interventions, IV and drugs, um, all improved. Post-course surveys, um, so it's, we have kind of a cranky bunch of people in our service. To see 100% of them like the, uh, the program was encouraging. And uh, the other part, interesting part was um, they all said they were going to use it in practice. And usually these surveys went out two weeks after they'd taken the course. And even that two-week span, almost two-thirds of them said they had uh, implemented the strategy on calls. So the classroom data is nice, but you want to see is improvement in what we're doing in the field. So this is... Um, Data, this is just kind of some gross data. Just, we just took a quick look, say, hey, what was happening in the field. And um, this is looking at 2011 before this project started and 23 after the two pilot phases were complete. And uh, just taking a quick look at monitoring. So we saw a big jump in the amount of uh, non-invasive CO2 monitoring being used in the field and also saw a jump in uh, CPAP usage. So to get a better handle of what's going on, we did a review of um, bronchospasm patients because they were easy for us to track and uh, they're the patients we're looking at doing a lot of these medical interventions for. So um, we did, uh, we kind of took three snapshots of what we were doing for bronchospasm patients, and we wanted to select kind of a sicker group. So we uh, took patients that had vital sign alterations. So cloud score less than 15, um, hypoxia, tachycardia, and tachypnea. If they had any of that, we included them. We excluded pediatrics just because they would have different vital signs parameters and no transport. So we took kind of three snapshots. One for a six-week period before um, we started the program, one for a six-week period after the first pilot, and another uh, six-week period, or sorry, another month period um, after the second pilot. So some of the stuff we looked at was uh, what we were doing as far as patient monitoring. So pretty much everyone got pulse oxes on these respiratory patients, that's fine. But we did see statistically significant improvement in the uh, number of patients EKGs were being done on and, uh, and tidal CO2 monitoring was being done on. So we had a statistically uh, significant bump on that. Look at some key interventions. CPAP uh, didn't really see a big bump, but this was a bronchospasm group, so it wasn't like a CH curve group where we'd really look for that big bump. So in this group, it didn't really bump that much. But uh, as far as IVs and appropriate medications, especially a solumedrol and magnesium, um, once again, we saw um, statistically significant improvement there. So really the thing we want to look at is did we make an impact in these crashing patients' uh, cases and did we reduce the mortality we were seeing? So if we compared um, 2011 which is the, before we started this project, to 2012 to 2013, we saw a nice drop off in number of cases. So we had um, 20 in 2011, I think we had 17 here, and then last year we had nine. And then looking at the percentage of after they arrested, um, did we get pulses back? We're about 25% of the time here. And in 2013, when they did arrest, we got over half of them back um, delivered to ED with pulses. 
When you look at all the cases, um, so this, this uh, data set here was only looking at the um, cardiac arrest outside of five minutes of the cruise contact with the patient. If you look at all the cases, we did see in 2013, we were seeing a few more of what we call these early cases where the patient arrests within the first five minutes. It may be limited in those cases what we can actually do for the patient. Um, it's obviously something where we want to address aggressively, but um, we did see a little uptick, uptick in uh, early arrests. I uh, don't know if that's just an aberrancy or not, but uh, we got two-thirds of those patients back too. So we kind of hit some of our targets we wanted to hit, and like I said, the biggest thing we want to see is this reduction in um, patients arresting after the first five minutes of contact. And we also got this nice bump. Um, over half the patients who did arrest were resuscitated in the field. Why was that happening? Uh, looks like we got a lot more efficient as far as intervening on these people. We're still seeing in these patients who arrested um, high preponderance, they were getting moved to the truck um, prior to the arrest, but more stuff was getting done for them. Uh, more patients were on the monitor, both EKG and ETCO2. Uh, more patients were going on CPAP. More patients had uh, IV access and um, appropriate fluid uh, resuscitation. So we got a lot more efficient in pretty much all these parameters as far as um, intervening more aggressively prior to the patient arresting. And uh, the jump in the IVs is probably going back to the uh, article by uh, Rittenberg and Guyette, um, but probably the reason that we had more success in resuscitating these patients. So when they did go south, maybe we had corrected some of that uh, physiology already, or um, is also just a case of, hey, if they arrested, we had IV access and they could get early epinephrine and stuff. Um, so the uh, quality improvement program seemed to work uh, very well. And uh, just going to finish up with a, uh, another uh, case scenario here, and it's just showing kind of post this intervention the uh, care levels being provided. So this is a patient I showed you a little bit of earlier, 27-year-old uh, male, short of breath, history of asthma. Um, you saw those vital signs earlier, but he's um, tachycardic, um, tachypneic, pulse ox is kind of okay, CO2 is high, which we know is bad, and uh, he's tachycardic. So instead of moving this guy, he gets an aggressive intervention, um, gets O2 and albuterol right off the bat, gets an early IV, gets solumedrol, magnesium, gets some epi, um, wasn't doing well, so they transitioned him to uh, CPAP. And then everything that could be done in the field was done. He was moved, transported to the hospital. And at the hospital, was still fairly sick, but uh, was placed on bi transition to BiPAP, received additional albuterol and epi, and uh, this patient did uh, pretty well. So that's a patient... Uh, Prior to this intervention, it might have been uh, rapidly moved to the truck, and we may have lost that opportunity to get all the uh, appropriate things done and uh, intervene. So just kind of in summary, um, I think we kind of demonstrated you know, our philosophy is early moves of, of sick medical patients is kind of a bad idea. Um, at least in our system, it seems to be um, associated with increased mortality. It's really paramount um, to get that physiological monitoring in place. You know, if the patient's going to go bad, we want to know about it. If the patient's bad right off the bat, I want the stuff that's going to tell me that. And then uh, aggressive BLS care and ALS should be done before we move. And, and like I said, if you're a BLS provider, a lot of that ABC stuff you can do. Manage the airway, assist the ventilations, put them on CPAP. Um, a lot of that can be done by your BLS providers. But uh, initially, immediately take care of these ABC problems, and then when ALS is available, get your IV access, fluid resuscitate or appropriate medications. And then once those medications are in, once you've done everything you can do for this patient, now's the time to make the move. Um, we've, get, we've done our best to stabilize this bad physiology, and now we have the opportunity to safely move that patient uh, to the truck and prevent a, a bad outcome. And uh, that's all I have. I'd be happy to uh, entertain any questions, and uh, thank you. <laughs>